Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm excited to welcome you to a great conversation tonight between Michael Heller, Jim Saltzman, and Bart Gelman. Thanks for attending. FAN's a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 175 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now for introductions. Michael Heller is the Lawrence I. A. Excuse me, Lawrence A. Ween Professor of Real Estate Law at Columbia Law School and is one of the world's leading authorities on ownership. His influential and widely reviewed book, The Gridlock Economy, reveals an ownership paradox that he discovered. Creating too many property rights can be as costly as creating too few. Ms. Professor Heller has served as Vice Dean for Intellectual Life at Columbia Law School and has taught at the NYU, UCLA, University of Michigan, and Yale Law Schools. Jim Saltzman is the Donald Bren Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law with joint appointments at the UCLA School of Law and the UC Santa Barbara School of Environment. He is one of the world's leading experts on environmental protection, counseling governments from Australia, Canada, and England to India, Uruguay, and China. Saltzman's popular book, Drinking Water, A History, was featured in the New York Times, Nature, and Scientific American. Saltzman has taught at Columbia, Duke, Harvard, Stanford, and Yale Law Schools. And fun fact, he was the first Harvard graduate to earn joint degrees in law and engineering. I like that fun fact. Bart Gelman, a staff writer at The Atlantic, is the author most recently of Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden and the American Surveillance State, and the best-selling Angler, the Cheney Vice Presidency. Before joining The Atlantic, Gallman spent 21 years at The Washington Post, where he served tours as legal, diplomatic, military, and Middle East correspondent. Among many professional honors, Mr. Gallman anchored the team that won the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for coverage of the National Security Agency and Edward Snowden. He was previously awarded the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting for a series on Vice President Dick Cheney. And in 2002, he was a member of the team that won the Pulitzer for national reporting for coverage of the 9-11 attacks and their aftermath. Whew. We're fortunate to have this brilliant trio of experts who will explain how ownership rules our lives. Now let's listen and learn. You know, my, my first question, uh, I guess this is for Michael, is uh, you, you guys both teach at world-class law schools. You're uh, traded, traded art is in, in textbooks and casebooks and learned journal articles. Why did you decide that you wanted to write a trade book for ordinary folks like me to read about property? It turns out actually to, to uh, it turns out to be a lot harder, at least for me, maybe not for you, but a lot harder for me uh, to write a trade book than an academic article. With academic articles, there's a lot of shorthand uh, we use a lot of big words um, and it doesn't, we, um, we reach a very small number of people. So my last book before this one um, reached an audience of 23 people. I wrote it, I, I knew the names of every potential reader. Um, so Jim and I had both written trade books before and it's just so much more fun and so hard to try to crystallize big and important ideas that's, uh, that's important to us, try to crystallize them for people who don't care at all and don't have to read it. Like who only read it if it's gonna be fun, interesting, it's gonna change their lives in some way. So for me, that's like the biggest and most fun challenge as an academic at this point, Jim? Yeah, I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, Michael and I are both teachers uh, and there's no, there's no better way as a teacher to try to get your ideas out there than to write a book that people actually wanna read. I mean, when you're writing textbooks, you have an audience really of one and that's the professor because once the professor says, this is the book, all the students have to buy it. It's not like that. Uh, for a popular book. People can either buy it or not buy it. And to, to try to write something so they really want to turn the next page, that's really hard to do. For, for this I'll, book. I just want to say that uh, having read it, it, it's a terrifically readable, uh, engaging book, which, which um, it, it's filled with anecdotes and narrative and kind of fascinating insights, which make you look at the world differently. Thank you. For this book, we really wanted to uh, crystallize uh, ideas that Jim and I have been, have been sort of percolating for now almost 25 years of teaching. It turns out um, that we realized that there were just these very few stories, just six, 
simple ways that everybody claims everything in the world. And we figured if we can get that across to people, it would change just how you go through your daily life. When you see, like, um, you know, Jim and I both have uh, uh, kids. When we saw our kids in the playground, when they're fighting over a shovel, and they're both saying, mine, 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 like we realize like what's going on there is actually there, it's a narrative about ownership. Like, you know, my daughter is saying, it's mine, I had it first. And my son is saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to it. Possession is nine tenths of the law. So we, and, and, and that's two, you know, first in time and possession is nine tenths of the law. That's two of what turned out to be just six simple stories that everybody uses for everything. So sort of getting that across to people, we thought would be a really useful, fun, way to spend a few years working together. But take, take an example you give at the beginning of the book, which is fascinating, which has to do with uh, passengers on an airplane and you're sitting there minding your own business. The person in front of you decides to lean way back right into your lap. Uh, who owns that space? Who's, whose space is it uh, that this person just leaned into? How do you how do you navigate that with your stories about ownership? Yeah, so this is super interesting. Let me sort of Bart, let me sort of build up the story a bit more. That we use big guy called James Beach, about six foot one, frequent traveler, gets on a flight uh, from Boston to Denver. Plane takes off. He's in the middle seat, and he puts down his tray table. And before he takes out his laptop to start working, he puts on these two plastic clamps called a knee defender. You can get it for twenty one bucks on the internet. And it says, the knee defender defends your knees so you don't have to. What are they talking about? The seat in front is locked in place. So the woman who is sitting in front of him tries to lean back. She can't. Turns around, realizes what's going on, asks him to remove the clamps. Maybe he agrees, maybe he doesn't. In any case, he doesn't do it fast enough. So she jams her seat back. The knee defenders pop out. The laptop goes into his, his chest. He jams the seat back up. She then turns around and takes her glass of water and throws it in his face. We actually don't know how this might have escalated because the captain ordered an emergency landing in Chicago. And they're both, I assume, somewhat abashed, taken off the plane. But here's what's interesting. So we normally would think about this as a matter of courtesy. He was rude, she was rude. But as you pointed out in your question, it's about ownership, right? The question is who owns, who controls that wedge of space behind the seat? So Michael earlier was talking about stories. So Instead of this, the thing about this is two unreasonable people, let's think of it from a storytelling perspective. So Beach is saying possessions nine tenths of the law. I control this space. I control from the the the, the biscuit, the cookie, you know, uh, co uh, coated um, uh, rug beneath me up through the the luggage. Right? I was there. I'm holding on to it. If you back into that, you're trespassing. She says, no, 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 I've got this button on my arm control. This allows me to go back. It's attachment, it's mine because it's attached to something I own. So you've got these two competing, competing stories. Who's in the right? So I, I, I'm gonna ask Lonnie if we can do this. We may not be able to. Is it possible to do a poll or not? And if not, that, that's not a problem. Perfect, all right. So if everyone sees this poll, this is awesome. So just answer this. Do you think it's okay if on a crowded flight if someone reclines into your seat or not? I'm sorry, this is done differently. You're in front. If you can recline, you should do it. And other people are saying, no, 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 you shouldn't recline on a crowded flight. Um, so I'm super interested to see how this is gonna come out. Michael and I have our predictions. And Lonnie, once you've got a fair number of, uh, of votes, if you can tell us. Well, I'll let you. I'll let you know once it stabilizes. Okay. Well, as long as as long as the numbers are roughly holding, it doesn't matter. Yeah, they're moving a little bit. Okay, I'm going to end it here. Okay, everybody, time's up. You ready? Yep. And poll, and I'm going to share the results on screen. You're going. To... Good. So, okay. Michael. Well. Um, he, um, Here's the thing, uh, the results in this crowd are 60% don't do it, 40% do. Jim and I have given this poll for many audiences, dozens of audiences, thousands of people, um, and there's, it is extremely consistent um, in the results. So in a audience which is uh, sort of a, a equally um, uh, gender balanced, age balanced audience, we invariably get 50-50%, sometimes exactly 50-50. So I can deduce 
uh, from the results here that 60% don't recline, a 40% do. But this is probably a somewhat more um, female audience than a somewhat more male audience. It tends to skew more in this direction uh, when it's uh, a more heavily uh, female audience. Um, so uh, sort of where, where norms of politeness might be slightly more powerful um, rather than sort of a certain sort of notion of, uh, for, um, the, the results here are exactly what you'd expect for an audience, which Lonnie said in, in, is in fact the case here, uh, skewed, somewhat, uh, skewed somewhat female. So what you're saying when you're saying don't lean back is you're asserting the story of first, I was first in time, or as Jim said, possessions by the of the law. When you're saying, yes, it's okay to lean back, you're asserting the story of attachment. It's mine because it's attached to this button. Both of these are absolutely plausible. Um, these are three, first, possession and attachment, three of those six stories. Um, and in every case, what may, be, what may be surprising to you for the folks who are listening tonight, what may be surprising um, isn't so much your own view, like of course you're right, but what may be surprising is that almost half the audience, or in some cases, you know, depending on where you are, more than half the audience disagrees with you. Like, how is that possible? But there's that kind of disagreement on something as simple as can you lean back or not? And the well, answer- Why? why? Oh, go ahead. Well, the answer is that um, what people are telling in their minds, what you're thinking about, is a sort of psychological story that's going on here, it, are these competing stories of mine. Um, and, uh, you frame your version of it as natural, as right, as fair, as the baseline of what it, what it has to be. Um, and, and, and yet, almost half the people out there disagree with you. What's, what's impressive about this story for us is that that conflict is one that we each of us suffers as an airline passenger. And we think it's just our own private anxiety, our own private struggle, whether to lean back or not. What people don't realize is that the airlines have deliberately engineered this struggle in order to sell that same space, that wedge, twice. They sell it both to the person in front to lean back and to the person behind uh, for their laptop and uh, their tray table and so on. So what the airlines do is they are profiting from that ambiguity about who controls the space. Ambiguity, strategic ambiguity, um, which is what we call it in the book, is one of the most advanced tools of ownership design. And ownership turns out to be ambiguous in this way much more often than people realize. So this is a way where airlines have figured out what they have to sell is that space. And they figured out that they can sell that space twice and make a, make a lot of profit from that by pushing that ambiguity onto you and me to work out um, who controls the space on every back and front seat, on every flight, on every, you know, on every plane. Um, and so that's actually- Push it, right? So, you know, when I was growing up, there never used to be fights over reclining or not. No one cared. Why did no one care? Because the seats were farther apart. The airlines have reduced what's called pitch, which is the measure between seats. It used to be about 33, 34 inches. Now it's closer to 28, 29. There's less space between seats. We're more like sardines and we're using the trade tables differently. They're now valuable. It's no longer just to eat rubber chicken. Now it's a workspace. Right? That's where you watch your movies. That's where you do your work. And so we see this all the time with ownership. As a resource becomes scarcer and more valuable, people compete more. People care more about it. And the stories you tell become more important. The last thing to mention on this, airlines have a rule. The rule is you can recline. They will never tell you that rule because they would much rather have you be angry at your other passengers than be angry at the airline for enforcing the rule. They're profiting, right? And this whole thing, economy plus, that didn't used to exist anymore, right? That's a space, the airline with, with seats wider apart. It exists because they've crammed us together in the other part of the plane. You're willing to pay more so you can work on your laptop and not worry about someone reclining. You talked a little bit before about um, kids at a playground. Is, is ownership as simple as that? I mean, do, do children, even toddlers, instinctively understand ownership? So this is, this is one of those interesting things we found. One of the first words that children speak in any culture, anywhere in the world, is mine, right? It is instinctual. So it's going to be springtime soon. I gather in Chicago, it's going to be a little farther than, than it is in other places, but spring will come. Uh, and when it does, we're going to hear the chirping birds. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that bucolic? If you could actually hear what the birds are saying, you'd think differently. Because what the birds are usually saying is, hey, buddy, don't cross this line. Birds often sing to mark their territory. 
So any organism is going to defend what it thinks is, is its most important resource, whether it is territory or food or sexual partners or anything else. And what Michael and I argue in our book is you have to have rules of ownership that are simple and understandable so you don't kill each other too often. I wanted to ask about the story in your book, uh, their pair of siblings uh, who uh, are dividing up their inheritance. Uh, parents have passed away. And one of the things they have to split up, they have to decide what to do with is, am I getting this right? It was a rocking chair. Yeah. Tell, 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 tell us that story. Well, um, so um, uh, uh, the dad uh, passes away and leaves Arthur and Mildred the rocking chair. Oh, the chair that they rocked in this kid. That doesn't have any monetary value, but it means a lot to these two kids. Um, Arthur just takes it out of his dad's house. Mildred says, hey, uh, we have to share this. Um, and uh, Arthur says, no, and she sues him. So this is a very American story. Um, uh, but the thing is, you know, there's no actual law for who, turns out, for who gets a rocking chair, for who gets an item like that when someone passes away and leaves it to the kids. Uh, what does that mean? Um, so the judge has to just make it up. And that's, this is something that, we, that, that um, I ask my students every year is, you know, there is no actual law. It was a case the judge had to make a decision. Like, what should you do? What should be the story of mine uh, in a context where uh, you have to make a choice? And there's a lot of choices. What are the possibilities here? Well, it turns out there's, there's many. Um, so one possibility is flipping a coin, um, which it turns out is the one thing a judge can't do. The judge flips a coin, uh, they get reversed. They, you, you can't, as a judge, just uh, you uh, rule uh, uh, based on chance. You have to give a reason. Um, you could... Um, uh, have an auction, uh, you know, whichever kid pays the most for it. There's no third party that would buy it. It's not worth, the chair wasn't worth anything. You could auction it. But that isn't really very satisfying because it sort of substitutes money in what's really a personal family kind of context. Um, you could um, uh, burn the chair, sort of the Solomonic solution, which would tell people, you know, don't waste the court's time. You guys are siblings, work it out. Um, you could uh, be, have it awarded to the one who's first. But that isn't particularly appealing either. You know, Arthur was first to grab it. Mildred was first to sue. Um, you can make them uh, shift it back and forth every uh, year or every day. Um, but shifting it back and forth, it, well, that's very expensive. You know, they, have, they don't live near each other. Um, they get into fights over who repairs the chair when it gets a little bit broken. Um, it rewards the kid who has more you know, time to waste than the kid who has more money. But here's the point about that story, which is for the rocking chair, there's no correct answer. There's no legal answer. Um, our law students often think that there's a legal answer to everything. And, and one of the hardest things to get across to young lawyers is that law is massively overrated. Like each of us is in ownership disputes a hundred times a day. Like who gets to the front of the Starbucks line first? Or who gets the COVID shot first? Or the wedge of space on the airplane? All of these are ownership conflicts that are decided outside of the law. Um, based on some other set of values and norms and things that we care about. So for the rocking chair, like what do you care about? Like, what do you think? This is, I guess, a question for, the, for your listeners. If we had a poll, um, we could ask you, like we could, give, we could list six or 10 um, options, you know, cut the chair in half and give each of them half of the rocking chair. Um, uh, you, could do a lot, you could imagine a lot of things. Um, uh, and the answer is that, there's, is that you have to basically make a choice. And that, that was one of the big takeaways from us, for, for us, and we hope that you get from reading the book, which is once you see how ownership stories really work, you realize that you have the power to make a choice. And if you're not making the choice about the, which story dominates, somebody else is making the choice for you in the way that you, you feel you're making a choice in the airline seat, but the airlines have actually made that choice and done it in such a way to advantage them and disadvantage you. So for the rocking chair, do you choose time or money? Do you choose strength or chance? No matter what choice you make, you're basically signaling some very deep set of values that you bring, not just to a rocking chair, but to life as to life more generally. There, there isn't the right answer. What there is is your answer. And so to make it, you know, even more sort of, I, I, that's exactly right. To make it even more personal, I imagine many of the folks watching tonight have kids, right? And so ask yourself, how do you decide who gets the last piece of dessert? Everyone's been served. There's an extra piece at the end. Do you give it to the kid who did their homework, who got all A's, um, who took the dog out for a walk, uh, who finished their P's? Um, 
we basically are using access to a resource to be technical, but basically we're deciding who gets ownership of this scarce resource to reward, to push a certain value. We don't think about it that way, but that's, that's what's going on. Let me just actually jump in on that. What, what got me, one of the things I think that got me interested in ownership, my parents told me this from when I was very young, is I have two younger brothers. I'm the oldest of three. Um, and, my, and we used to, my, my brothers and I were like, like the consistent thing that would happen is we would fight over who got the biggest piece of pie or whatever the dessert was that night. Flan was a big one in our house. Um, and my parents were just sick of hearing it. And no matter how they cut it, we would fight over the pieces. And they came up with a genius ownership strategy, which um, I still remember now, almost you know, 55 years later, which is um, uh, they had me actually, as the oldest, I would cut um, the pie into three pieces, but I chose last. So I learned from a very young age, my, like my superpower is how to precisely divide everything in thirds, precisely. Um, but what it did for my parents as the ultimate owner of that resource, the slice of pie, is it completely ended the fights among the three of us over pie. They just offload, they, it's basically the same way the airlines offload the seat conflict onto, onto, onto you, your story of first versus attachment or possession versus attachment, my parents offloaded the pies uh, conflict onto me and my brothers. And it just ended the, ended the dispute. So we've been talking about chairs. There's another chair in the book. Uh, and it works differently in different cities, which I found absolutely fascinating. Uh, it has to do with a, a, a parking place. I'll let you guys set it up. Tell, tell me the chair and, and, the, and the parking place. This is a Chicago yeah, so gather, story. Jim? Yeah, I gather that there are a lot of folks who are watching from Chicago, or at least from the great north, if not, if not just Chicago. So look, after, and I grew up in Boston, so I, I know wherever I speak. So after a big snowstorm, you look outside, and there are these sort of suggestive lumps of snow where your car used to be. So you go out there, spend a lot of time digging out your car, you pull out to go to work, and as you pull out, you think, this is not good, right? And why is this not good? Because some slump is gonna pull into your spot, and when you come home tonight, you've gotta to dig out another spot or, or find one that happens to be open. So this is the problem in a lot of places. In some cities, uh, Pittsburgh uh, is a great example of this, South Boston, another example, they have a tradition uh, called parking chairs. And basically, once you dig out your spot, you put a chair, you can put a traffic cone. People have been known to put boxes of Fruit Loops uh, into the parking spot, and it works. People will not take that, take that parking spot. Um, and there are a few things that are really interesting about this. So one of them is that, um, so this is the rule in Philadelphia, it's the rule in Pittsburgh. If you try that in New York City, where both of you live, when you come back, not only will the parking space be gone, but the chair will be gone as well. New Yorkers give no respect to the parking chair. And what this suggests is that ownership speaks in dialects, informal ownership. Some people respect the chair, some people don't respect the chair. So that's a really interesting aspect of it. Second thing that's really interesting is when does this break down? So it used to be the practice in South Boston, South Boston started gentrifying, right? So South Boston is not the South End, this is the area uh, traditionally strongly Irish. This is where Whitey Bulger and the, the um, Went to Hill gang were, for those of you who are into, into those movies. Uh, and it started gentrifying. People came in who didn't know the tradition and didn't respect the tradition. And they started taking the spaces. And there was violence. Uh, car tires were slashed. Cars were keyed. Um, the mayor came in and said, OK, you could do it for three days. Um, but that's not really working that well right now either. And it's a great example of how Basically, there's this, um, when you're making symbolic possession, right? We can't put our arms around everything that we own. So at a crowded movie theater, you put a jacket on a seat. Most people respect that, but you don't, you don't own the seat. You can't take it all. What if you put, you know, at a graduation or a concert, you put 10 programs across the row? You know, people come in, how, do they respect that? Do they not respect that? This is a sort of um, silent communication that takes place. And it's all the language, uh, language of ownership. It's just like we're fish that are swimming, but don't realize we're swimming in water. We are swimming in the waters of ownership and these sort of signals of possession. Sometimes we recognize them, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we respect them, sometimes we don't. Michael, anything you want to add? Well, you know, Chicago is just such a great city for this story because it is so different 
from the rest of the country. In Chicago, you guys call it um, dibs. Um, the mayor, of, uh, Richard Daly, your, your uh, um, beloved former mayor, uh, once said, if someone spends all that time digging out a spot, do not drive into that spot. Like that is totally against the law. Like the law, you, you do not own your parking spot. Uh, but in Chicago, people, you know, from the mayor on down, do not mess with dibs. That is like as powerful an illustration as there is of the uh, role that ownership stories play in our lives. It is not the law. And it is something you do not mess with, a spot that somebody else uh, has signaled possession of uh, through, uh, through dibs. And adding on to the, the sort of the stories that we've been telling, so we've been said, you know, what are the six stories? Um, first come, first serve, first in time, I got it first. Possession's nine cents of the law, I'm holding on to it. Attachment, it's attached to something I own. The parking spot is labor. It's, I own it because I worked for it. I dug out the spot, therefore I have a, I have a, a better claim of possession to it than anyone else. That's four of the six. We'll get the rest of them by the, by the time the hour ends. I see actually a question in the Q&A, and they just mentioned the other two, maybe so we can have them on the table and maybe we can ask stories about them. Um, so we, we've mentioned first in possession and attachment, the button and labor. I worked for it, so it's mine. The other two are, this, it's, um, it's mine because I own myself. Should I be able to sell my kidney or my blood or uh, just, state, um, just state a baby for, uh, for somebody else, my womb? Uh, and the, that's the fifth, has to do with self-ownership. And the last one is family ownership. It's mine because I'm part of the family. And we have very different rules in this country about who owns what around family ownership. And that's it. All claims to ownership, but everyone claims everything through one of those six stories. You have a story in the book about a baseball. It's a baseball hit by Barry Bonds. What happened to that ball? And how's that fall in with your theories of property? So let me take you back to the summer of 1998, right? And again, there are a lot of Chicagoans here. Sammy Sosa, the great Sammy Sosa, is in a neck and neck battle with the evil Mark McGuire um, and um, Barry Bonds, right? They're all sort of hitting, hitting home runs. Um, Bonds is going for the single record uh, for, um, uh, for the home runs in a season. Uh, and his last game is at Pactel Park in San Francisco. And there's a guy who has studied basically where Bonds baseballs actually landed in Pactel Stadium. Uh, he goes there on the last day. He's bought a particular seat in the bleachers. He brings a baseball glove. Uh, the ball is, is pitched to Bonds swings, cracks, the ball goes shooting out of the stadium right to where this guy is standing. Comes down, the ball goes into his glove and just as it hits his glove, he is mobbed by all of the other folks who want a piece of the action. The ball is dislodged from his glove, rolls around and this poor schlub who just come to the game, a guy called Hayashi, just literally just picks up the ball. He's surrounded by security, he's hustled off, the ball is put in a safe, it's valued at a million dollars. And of course, this being the great country of America, they sue each other, right? Popov, who was the guy who, who went there, um, Popov essentially is arguing uh, labor. I worked to figure out where the ball would land. He's arguing first possession. I had it first. Hayashi is arguing uh, current possession. I'm holding the ball. He's also arguing I had it first, saying, look, you didn't, you didn't really have it. Um, and so this goes to the judge and it's a wonderful decision to read because the judge goes through all these different stories about wh who, who should own it. So actually, Bart, let me, let me turn it on you. If, if you were the judge, how would, how would you do justice in this case? Would you give it to Popov, give it to Hayashi, some other clever, clever uh, result? My intuition is that Hayashi gets it. Because whoever ends up because, with it. Because, it. yeah, I mean, because Popov didn't really have it. Right. So then, and, what you, and what you say is actually when I talk, to, when I ask my, I pull my students about this and uh, students who are baseball fans pretty much say the, the custom of the stands is what should govern. And the custom of the stands is whoever holds the bowl up that shows it to the jumbotron, uh, that's yeah. who the owner is. And everything before that doesn't, is basically the scrum that doesn't count. Um, I have a different view, which is this, that what we want to do is like tell people, like I'm a pretty incompetent uh, ball catcher. And I'm one of many, like thousands of people get injured every year um, at football stadiums, I mean, at baseball stadiums, balls fly in and they hit people in the head and they get concussions. It is, uh, it is actually, you know, it can be dangerous. Um, so what we want is like vigilant fans with gloves who are good at catching things, 
having the confidence to know that the, if they do, they won't get mobbed by people who will then take it away from them. So I would actually have a different rule, not a rule that sort of is fairer in some sense to after the event has happened uh, to um, Hayashi, but a rule that basically sends a message. But one of the ways we use ownership rules is what Jim and I call a remote control. The ownership rules all work uh, to tell you to do what somebody else basically wants. Um, so in this case, I want a rule that says Hayashi gets an unimpeded chance to uh, catch the ball, like football. pass interference in football. The receiver gets a chance. If they get interfered with during that, uh, it's a penalty. Why? Because that tells the Popovs of the world, going forward, come to the stadium, bring your glove, we're gonna protect you. So it seems to me that's a, an approach that to the extent that what ownership rules can do is save fans you know, from getting concussions, that's the rule that I want. What the judge did in this case, he just split, you know, he did the, uh, you know, cut the ball in half, they each get um, half of the auction price of the ball. Not, not my preferred solution. But the thing that's so wonderful about this story is it shows there's no right answer, right? You've got a point, Bart, Michael has a point, the judge has a point, someone's got to decide. And each, each rule we have for who gets what, it pushes a certain value to the front and it pulls others back. So if you're thinking about social utility or civic virtue, um, how would you analyze the question of, uh, of paying someone to stand in line for you? Right, I mean, it used to be that uh, back in the old days when we had in-person uh, oral arguments that uh, to get into a Supreme Court oral argument, you had to stand in line. Uh, uh, or if you want free tickets for Shakespeare in the Park in New York City, you, uh, people start lining up for that before dawn. Uh, what, what if I pay someone to stand in line for me? How do you look at that? We, we um, Jim and I write in the, in, um, in the book about this incredible phenomenon that happens um, at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is actually, for those of you who visit Washington, it is the best free show in Washington, DC. Like you can, the tickets to the Supreme Court, you walk in for free uh, and you sit just, you know, steps from the justices and you get to hear like some of the best advocates in the country arguing right in front of you, like right in front of you with the nine justices uh, sitting, uh, sitting right there. Um, so but, so this, is, this has been noticed by many people that this is a great free show. And people start lining up often days ahead uh, for these free tickets and they police the line, nobody can cut. Um, what several companies in DC realized is that there was a market uh, for people who had a lot more money than time. And then what, what these companies do is they hire homeless people uh, to stand in line for days. And um, when the line starts moving into the court, all these bedraggled people at the very front step out of line and the person in a gray suit and briefcase uh, steps in uh, and goes into the courtroom. And it turns out those people who, who are stepping in um, have paid thousands, sometimes five or $10,000 uh, for access to the courtroom for that free ticket. So what you, have is, what you have in DC there is an intermediary who's figured out how to turn uh, time into money, how to basically redesign first come first served. And we're seeing this not just at the Supreme Court, but all across the all across the economy. When you go to get tickets for uh, you know for uh, Hamilton on Broadway, uh, or when you go with tickets for the free concert in this in the park, uh, for um, new Apple iPhones, uh, for Supreme uh, sneakers, uh, whatever the whatever you see a line of people today that for the, the DMV today, there's likely to be someone who's being paid to wait there. So we, what we're doing, what we're finding more and more is that the ownership story of first come, first serve is being turned upside down by savvy entrepreneurs. The real rule today in sector after sector of the economy is first come, last serve. And this is happening very quietly. You know, you don't announce that you're, um, you created this, you know, that, that the, person, the person in front of you doesn't say, hey, I'm being paid to wait here. Um, but something to think about it next time you're in line is, you know, is this the way we want our democracy to work? With the people who get to hear uh, the Supreme Court arguments. Similarly, for people who get to go to congressional hearings. Congressional hearings today uh, largely are paid line standers um, are the ones who uh, are selling the um, access to who gets in. And Jim, do you wanna talk a little bit about, about Disney as an example, like the master of first come last served? Yeah, but before I get to Disney, just on the example you gave, I mean, what's interesting to us is we talked to a lot of people about this. There are plenty of folks who say there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, this is capitalism at its best. It is creating jobs for the homeless where there were none before. 
Uh, this isn't this is a, an asset, a resource, and we're basically finding a way to make money by by getting access to the resource. And other people say it's as Bart said, this is just feels wrong. All right, this feels anti-democratic. There, you know, there are different ways to think about what's the nature of the, the resource, which in this case is the place in line. So take Disney, as, as Michael suggested. So Disney builds itself as the happiest place on earth, the most magical place on earth, number one honeymoon location uh, in the entire United States. You know when it's not the happiest place on earth? It's when you're waiting three freaking hours to get onto Space Mountain. That is when it's not the happiest place on earth. Because uh, Disney used to operate first come, first serve. They realized they had a problem, which is they had a lot of unhappy customers who didn't want to wait in line for hours, one. Two, they had a lot of people who were waiting in line and not, being and not buying giant turkey thighs or drumsticks or Mickey Mouse ears or anything. You know, they weren't basically getting the, get, moving the merch. So they came up with something called the Fast Pass. And the Fast Pass essentially uh, is a ticket you get when you get to the ride. And it says, if you come back within this 30 minute period, two to three hours from now, whenever it is, you can go to a separate line, essentially go, go straight in. And that was very successful. It basically uh, buffered the lines, much, much um, shorter line waiting people out buying things and such. But Disney realized that they actually could even make the, the next step, which was to say, well, you know, at the time, the, um, uh, the fast pass was free. They said, let's have a super duper fast pass. We'll call it the VIP pass. And for anywhere from three to $5,000 per day, your family can get on every ride immediately. No waiting. If you want to ride Splash Mountain 10 times in a row, knock yourself out. But Disney is a problem, which is the people waiting in line don't want to see this. And so there's a special line, oftentimes at the back of the ride, for these VIP folks. So what you've got is this notion of first come, first serve that's subverted because Disney sees that there's money on the table. Shortly after we published our book in March of last year, Disney replaced the Fast Pass with the Lightning Lane. The lightning lane is the same as the fast pass, but you have to pay for it. <laughs> so Disney realized there was still a little money left <laughs> on the table and they took that as well. But, but I do want to give the sense that this is all sort of subverting, subverting lines. So one last example, the fast lane on the highway, right? That's first come first serve also. Uh, in many cities, not during rush hour. During rush hour, it's reserved to carpool lanes, HOV, high occupancy vehicles. That's using the remote control of ownership to say, to get access to this place in line, to the fast lane, you've got a carpool. So we're gonna bring cars off of, the, off of the road. We're gonna improve air quality, which is a good thing. But governments don't like to leave money on the table either. And so what, they, what many cities have done is they've charged you during rush hour to get access to that lane. It's called congestion pricing. In DC, it can be up to 35 or $40 during rush hour to get into the fast lane uh, to get from Northern Virginia into DC. Wow. You gotta be in a big hurry if you're gonna do that every day. Or a, or, or a client paying, yes. <laughs> but, but the point there is that in all these stories, Disney and the Supreme Court, the uh, the HOV lane, what you're seeing there is, is ownership engineers. You're seeing uh, the Disney company or the line setting company or the um, transportation uh, department. Uh, so thinking about here's an asset that we control, whatever, um, and how do we steer people to use it in the way that's most valuable uh, to us? It might be making money, it might be reducing pollution, it might be reducing congestion, um, uh, but all of that doesn't happen. People think, oh, just this ownership is just this natural phenomena out there. It's mine or it's not mine, um, but that's not the way ownership works. Ownership is always these six competing stories, uh, and the people who understand how those stories work actually can steer you to do what they want, to you know, carpool or to uh, pay for a fast, pa you know, a fast pass or a VIP pass uh, or for a, a ticket to the Supreme Court. Um, so, it pay, so, so you can take a story like first come first serve and figure out how to profit by making it first come last serve. Uh, that can actually be a major business opportunity. Jim and I have written an article um, in the Harvard Business Review sort of showing uh, for, for, for entrepreneurs, how, how entrepreneurs use these stories uh, uh, to basically power a lot of cutting edge companies from, from Tesla uh, to Disney to HBO. So there are a lot of things in a modern economy that we think we're buying, but we don't actually own. We, we can put it in a shopping cart on, on, on the screen and click 
and say buy, but at the end of the transaction, we don't own it. Why is it, why does it work like that? And, and where does it work like that? Right. So Amazon is actually one of these companies that we've written about, which is they're super, you know, they're, they're very smart at like selling products, but they're super smart at designing um, at, uh, engineering ownership uh, to get you basically every one of you, every one of you who's downloaded a book on Amazon um, or a movie, uh, you've paid Amazon basically an unearned pre premium uh, uh, in that download. So here, here's how that works. When you, when you, when you, um, when you buy that book, you put it into that little shopping cart, which looks like a shopping cart, and you click buy now. Amazon engineers um, its online experience to mimic as much as possible the experience you have of buying things in the physical uh, world. Uh, and in the physical world, when you have a book, you say possession is nine tenths of the law. Um, it's mine. Um, Amazon can and has deleted books right off of people's uh, Kindles. Uh, uh, Apple has deleted movies right out of their iTunes accounts. It turns out that online, you own something much different and less than you believe that you own. Um, and that difference between what you believe that you own and what you actually own is where Amazon makes uh, a, this unearned uh, profit. Turns out when you poll people, almost about 85%, almost, almost everybody believes that buying an online book, um, buying a book online is the same as owning uh, the, um, the hard copy, but Amazon can't like walk into your house and take that hard copy off the shelf. They can and do delete every now and then that book off of your, um, off of your device. Um, this is one of the sort of examples of the difference between physical ownership, which people have a very deep, powerful, instinctive um, attachment to and uh, intellectual property ownership. People think they understand, uh, but they actually have a different and much less connection to. Actually, when you if you if you follow kids on a playground, um, if you if you hear them shouting, "It's mine! It's mine! It's mine!" and you go and ask and you go and check, what is it that they're shouting "mine" about? It's about a shovel or some food or the swing. It's never about a joke or a story. That joke was mine. That story is mine. You're not crediting me for my story. That like, doesn't happen on the playground. Kids have a powerful intuition about physical stuff and a different uh, space in the brain, a different sort of instinctive understanding about intellectual property. And Amazon is like geared up um, to, base, to um, take advantage of that, of that gap. I mean, this is really fundamental, Bart. I mean, we as a species have basically evolved with a sense that we own something, quite literally some thing. And we're now moving in the 21st century where we own less and less things and more and more access to streaming ones and zeros. So take this, right? This is, this is my, my iPhone. What is it really? What would I really own? I own a plastic brick. What makes the iPhone valuable? The operating system. I don't own that. What makes it important to me? All of my photos and emails and everything else, that actually doesn't belong to me either. Right, in terms of what I physically own, it's, a, it's not even a doorstop, right? It's too small for a doorstop. Uh, what the value there is having access to these, this streaming world. And we haven't sort of caught up to that in terms of our own sense of, of what we own and how we own things. It's a really epical, you know, EPOC um, transformation that's taking place right now. Well, let, let, let's talk about data uh, and personal data. Uh, when I click around the internet, I am creating valuable data that someone owns. Why isn't it me? It could be you. You know, this is one of the most pressing questions about ownership of our time is who owns your clickstream? You know, when, when you go, you know, you guys are in Chicago, you go fly to New York for the weekend. Um, when you've come back to Chicago or on, on your way to Chicago, like for the next couple of weeks, you'll see all these ads on your, on your, um, on the, you know, bars on the side and in your Facebook uh, stream saying, you know, shows in New York or uh, hotels in New York. And how is that? And the, the reason that you get all those ads is that um, when you click around online, all that data is being captured, um, including how you vote is being captured. And it, you, you, think you, don't, you think your vote is private, uh, but these are the companies that track you online can have extremely accurate uh, guess about how you're going to, whether and how you're going to vote as well. Um, and medical conditions you may not even know about, they can um, anticipate or, or send you ads about. Um, your click stream individually is worth hundreds of dollars every year. It's what powers Google and Apple. 
Um, and like any new resource, like that wedge of space in the airline seat, uh, it wasn't a scarce resource when this pitch was pretty wide. It becomes a scarce resource when the pitch is smaller. It's the same growth in value that happens on the, um, on the internet. Your data now becomes extremely valuable. And when it becomes valuable, you start to have competing stories about who should own it. So what the airlines do, actually they say the same thing as the, as the um, person with the recline button. They say our app, your data attaches to our apps. So they're basically leaning their apps into your most personal intimate space. Uh, in the absence of clear property rights, when property owner, when ownership is ambiguous, and it is ambiguous very often, is always, almost always ambiguous, um, or often ambiguous, um, uh, the data companies will step in. Google has stepped in, Amazon has stepped in, um, uh, Apple has stepped in, Facebook has stepped in, all of them saying this, this attaches to our, to, our, to our product, our apps. So here's, here's what you can do though. You, know, you can push back, right? It doesn't have to be that way. Um, this is actually a question that's very much up for grabs now. You can say, the data is mine, self-ownership or um, I was first. Um, the, uh, for data ownership, it's very hard to do that individually, but this is a sort of knowledge, I hope, that can empower, empower you as listeners and as readers uh, to begin to pressure uh, representatives to act as <laughs> citizens rather than as consumers, um, to change the way, to be alert to the way uh, that uh, data companies are uh, taking advantage of what could be very well your data. And there's a subtler aspect of this as well that I want to sort of share this a, a well-educated audience. I mean, click streams are normally described as a privacy issue. They don't have a right to sort of have information to, to have access to my information. That's a binary, either they get access or they don't get access. If you think about this in terms of ownership, what you can say is, okay, you can use my click stream, but it's mine, so pay me for it. And, and that could be worked out, right? It, once you start to think of things through the ownership lens, different solutions appear that just wouldn't have emerged if you thought of this solely as a privacy issue. Talking about this, this, the streaming media has reminded me that you make an interesting point in the book about companies like HBO and what their attitude is when you share your password with someone who doesn't live in your house. Uh, it's, it's actually a little surprising. Ex explain that. Yeah, so, you know, Michael and I are both law, law professors, and we'll ask our students, how many of you share passwords or know people, you know, don't out yourself, but know people, wink, wink, who share passwords, every hand goes up. These are law students, right? This is clearly illegal. It clearly is against the terms in their contract, and yet everyone does it. Here's what's so fascinating. Uh, Amazon, I'm sorry, HBO obviously knows they're doing this. HBO thinks this is great. In fact, the former head of HBO, a guy called Richard Plepler, said, we are creating video addicts, right? They know what you're doing. They could shut down the sharing immediately. It's what basically happened with record companies and Napster about 15 years earlier. Why aren't they? Because they're trying to build a fan base. Everyone knows this is not exactly kosher. And HBO, their strategy is we're going to have more and more people watch our shows. And as they get more money uh, over time, hopefully they will buy their own their own subscriptions as well. What's interesting is Netflix has been trying to, to break away from this. They know that people share passwords too. And so they had a beta thing where for a while, I haven't seen it recently, but for a while they would say, you know, you may, you may know, by what's the phrase they used uh, basically to trigger? They basically said, you know, you may be sharing a password or, you know, you may, be, uh, you may know someone is sharing a password. They basically would have a sort of little warning. Um, but the problem is people have now assumed that sharing the password is part, is part of what they own. It's very hard to, hard to change that. But one of the larger points is that sometimes uh, ownership protections are too strong, right? So in, in some respects, maybe there shouldn't be such protection of passwords for HBO. Elon Musk, you know, basically he doesn't believe in patents. Very few of his companies patent their discoveries. Uh, he relies on privacy uh, and secrecy instead. Michael? Yeah, so um, the, what, what HBO has discovered is another one of the most like advanced strategies at the cutting edge of corporate America. So, so airlines like United and Amer American and Delta, they use strategic ambiguity to sell that space twice. Um, uh, tolerated theft is another really powerful strategy. Tolerating theft in order to have some other 
corporate goal. So HBO uh, um, tolerates theft as a customer acquisition, acquisition strategy. Not accidentally, this is a deliberate, very thought out strategy on, on, um, um, uh, by the firm uh, to uh, have you feel a little bit bad, to know that you're stealing from them, but not feel that bad that you don't do it. Um, uh, Disney does the same thing. They um, used to sue anybody who would uh, knock off their merchandise. Um, and uh, they, um, they no longer uh, do that. They now tolerate not just a lot of fan fiction, they tolerate online fan websites that sell uh, uh, new Mickey merchandise. So for example, like uh, these little uh, 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 velveteen uh, Mickey uh, ears, um, uh, pink rose gold Mickey ears, some a woman named Bibbidi Bobbidi Brook created a little online store and had a huge hit with her, with her Mickey ears. Um, Disney could have shut her down, but they decided to tolerate the theft of their IP. Why? Not for customer acquisition the way um, HBO does, uh, but as basically cheap uh, product R&D. So they then, uh, what Disney then did is like, they look around at all the pirate sites and when they see a winner, like the rose colored Mickey ears, they then put those ears into the official Mickey stores where they were a huge hit and sold out. So it turns out that for Disney as well, tolerating theft is a pretty powerful, has become a pretty powerful business uh, strategy. When people signed up uh, for this webcast, they had an opportunity to uh, propose a question to ask. And I'm gonna propose, I'm gonna ask one of the ones that were proposed, which is that if you post something on social media, like an image, a photograph, a poem, uh, and you've therefore kind of put it out there for the world to see, uh, is, is it open to public use? Can someone reproduce that or do you still own it? Um, no, when you, uh, when you uh, post an, uh, an image or something you write, uh, you uh, auto automatically have um, copyright in that. It's not. Um, uh, it's not. It's not free to be. Uh, it's not free to be used. Uh, you can post it uh, with a license that says to other people, "Hey, you can use this." Um, people do do a lot of usage that isn't uh, legal as well, and they aren't shut down. Um, but when you create something, a poem, or a social media post, a photo, um, that's that's yours. Um, uh, now, when when you say say what you, say what you do is you post a video um, up on YouTube. And in the video, you use some, you, know, you, re you re remix a song, use a little bit of video clips. Um, almost all the stuff that you're using in your YouTube video uh, is copyright infringement of somebody else. Um, but we, we've, what, 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 um, what we now have online is um, like many uh, stories in our book, um, it turns out the, the formal law here is almost 100% completely irrelevant. Um, uh, YouTube, uh, Google um, has created its own private legal system for adjudicating um, how to manage exactly the question uh, th uh, the listener just asked tonight. They have something called um, uh, real ID for copyright ID, where they basically determine, they look at the sound weave, they look at the order of the shot, they look at how much you use of the song, and they either take it down um, or they allow, um, they allow your, uh, your, your homemade uh, video to stay up, but they put a little button next to it that lets the actual copyright owner monetize uh, your use of their, you know, the, the, you know the, the three second clip of Felicity or whatever it is that you were uh, stealing. I didn't mean to cut you off there. I hope that I, my, I didn't startle you when I turned on my camera. No, it's um, great to for, see you. Yeah, thanks for- I wish we could see our audience. We miss you all. <laughs> I know, well, you're gonna see them in just a few minutes at after hours, so that's the fun part. Yeah. Um, so I want to, first of all, remind everyone, first of all, thank you so much for a great conversation, very thought provoking. I'm sure people are thinking, well, what about, what about there? You probably get that all the time. We're like, well, what about this? What about that? Um, so come to After Hours. All you have to do to get to After Hours is buy a copy of mine uh, from our bookseller. We've been putting in links in chat, so uh, you can find the link in there. Come by it. Come, Michael is going to hang out with us for uh, at after hours. We're going to open it up at about eight oh five. We're going to give him a little bit of break. So, uh, we have a couple of great questions here. Um, Anne is asking, "Have you studied um, by culture? Meaning, do Americans tend to have more of an individualistic mind than other countries?" I'll give uh, a quick answer. So, actually, you go ahead, Michael. If you want. Go ahead. So it it turns out. So we get this question a lot, um, and. Um, Two key points. The first is all cultures, we've talked to anthropologists, we've given a lot of talks, no one has contradicted this. All cultures rely on these six stories. That's it. That said, different cultures will emphasize different stories. 
So in a more communal culture, oftentimes indigenous cultures are not always, uh, it's mine because I'm in the group, I'm in the family. That's much more important uh, than it's mine because I worked for it, for example. Um, and so we're all humans reading from the same storybook. We just are emphasizing different stories. Did you want to add anything, Michael, or no? no you're good. Good. Okay, good. Uh, Robin wants to know, in the six principles of ownership, where do the concepts of need or deserve fit in? And the question about dessert or the rocking chair, those concepts come to mind. Where do our subjective feelings of ownership come into play? Well, that's a great question. Um, and need tends, um, need, need is as in terms of answering this for ourselves, um, if, as a parent for the rocking chair, uh, need may very well be um, the principle that is ultimately the principle that's the most important one to us. Um, the most important principle to us as individuals uh, often is not at all uh, legible uh, in the law. Uh, so in the, in, the, uh, um, in the world of law as well, uh, you don't actually see need um, uh, typically as, um, as uh, one of those um, stories. Um, I worked for many years in socialist, uh, in the socialist and post-socialist economy world. Uh, where at least ostensibly uh, need uh, drove um, uh, who had access to resources. But part of the reason uh, th those, those countries, uh, the, the systems collapsed in Russia and Eastern Europe uh, in, the, in the late, uh, late 80s was that it turned out that it's sort of implementing a system based on need turned out to be very hard to do. And what people fell back on ultimately in those systems was one of the six stories uh, that we talk about uh, in the book that operationalizing, making need uh, the basis for um, allocating resources turns out to be pretty, uh, pretty hard to do. Uh, I want to, let's see, we're at 758. We have two minutes. Um, Jolene is asking, I'm curious if you know of the documentary Finders Keepers, a bizarre example of ownership. Quote, amputee John Wood finds himself in a stranger than fiction battle to reclaim his mummified leg from entrepreneur Shannon Wisnet, who found it in a grill that he bought at an auction. So here's I the thing it. about here's the thing about ownership. Like, <laughs> look at you guys smiling. Ah! I know I, it is like you know, uh, you know. I teach at a law school. I have colleagues, and the smart colleagues at the law school are the ones who teach constitutional law. Like, I've never understood constitutional. Like, what are they actually fighting about? But ownership, <laughs> like the amputated leg, the mummified leg, like that's the stuff I can connect to. The chair in the street in Chicago, like what's going to happen tomorrow after the snowstorm? That turns out to be a hidden and very intense ownership battle that you're having with your neighbors. Like that's what's cool about ownership. It's a very small number of stories. If you know those stories, you have a lot more power over the outcomes um, out in the world. Jim? Here are the stories, right? So basically John Wood says self-ownership. It's my mummified leg, right? And um, Shannon Wisnett says current possession, finders keepers, go weep you loser. Uh, and both both stories are valid. How are we going to decide which one is more legitimate? That's that's the the, the story of ownership. Oh my gosh! Uh, I want to ask you, and after hours, I'll find out a little bit more. I'm curious about uh, a statement that you made. I think it was Michael, uh, where you said you were drawing a distinction between acting as a citizen versus acting as a consumer. And I'm kind of interested in teasing that out a little bit. So anyway, we are done for tonight. Uh, Mr. Gelman, thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate it. I know you're busy. Same thing with you, uh, Professor Saltzman. Good luck with your event right after this one. 